The January 6th committee released new video ahead of Thursday's public hearing. The surveillance footage shows Republican Congressman Barry Loudermilk giving a private tour on January 5th. A person in that group marched on the Capitol the following day. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland has the details. The committee investigating the attack on the U.S. Capitol is focusing on the man in the gray sweatshirt. Seen on surveillance video taking photos of staircases and hallways in the Capitol complex on January 5th, the day before the attack. A day later, they say he was recording this video amid a crowd marching to the Capitol. We're coming in like white on rice for Pelosi, Nadler, <laughs> Schumer, even you, AOC. We're coming to take you out. We'll pull you out by your hairs. The committee says he was part of a tour group led by Georgia Republican Barry Loudermilk, some taking pictures of security checkpoints. The congressman denied any wrongdoing. I'm totally opposed and I condemn that kind of language. But no one in that group showed that type of aggression that day. I mean, they were just they were just here visiting. CBS News reached a member of the congressman's visiting group who also said it was not a reconnaissance mission, but the committee said the group stayed for several hours on a day the complex was closed to the public and photographed and recorded areas of the complex not typically of interest to tourists. Pennsylvania Democrat Brendan Boyle says this photo is a spot he's never seen photographed before and was near a sensitive area. That specific stairwell uh, was not too far away from where a large concentration of members were taken that afternoon while the insurrection was still going on in the Capitol. And Scott McFarland joins me now for more along with CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costas. Go, Scott, first to you. What does the committee hope to achieve by releasing this video now? Well, Matt, the timing is striking here. They released this video and this letter to Congressman Loudermilk 24 hours before their next national public hearing. So what they're trying to do, they say, is counter the narrative they hear from Mr. Loudermilk, who has denied giving tours of the Capitol, who has pushed back on these allegations in the past. The committee says Mr. Loudermilk forced their hand to release the video, and they say they tried to show him that video during a meeting. They've asked for a meeting. They've asked him to come in and sit with the committee. And so far, Matt, he's said no. Wow. So on Thursday, the committee will hold its third public hearing. It will focus on the pressure campaign placed on then Vice President Mike Pence to illegally delay the electoral count. So, Robert, to you, who will we hear from about Mike Pence and what might we actually learn? We potentially might learn a lot. There will be two central witnesses during Thursday's hearing. Number one, retired federal judge Michael Ludig, and also Pence former counsel Greg Jacob. These two men were part of Pence's decision-making process ahead of January 6, when the then-Vice President decided he would resist the pleas from then-President Trump to block the certification in Congress of then president-elect Joe Biden's election. So Ludig and Jacob will bring viewers into the room January 4th, January 5th, January 6th, 2021, as Pence finalized his decision and his letter to Congress outlining his argument. So not that you have a crystal ball, Scott, uh, Robert, excuse me, but could Mike Pence actually testify? He is not scheduled to testify. But it's notable that Pence's confidants, like Mark Short, his former chief of staff, have cooperated with the committee for hours. We expect to hear and see Mark Short not live on Thursday, but via video testimony that has been previously recorded. He is also not blocked in any way, having Greg Jacob, his former counsel, testify. And this will be an important moment for a lot of conservatives, Republicans tuning in to hear from Judge Ludig. He is highly respected on the right in this country and among others, but particularly among Republicans who see him as a, a rank and file conservative for years on the federal bench. CBS News has learned exclusively that Ludig will testify, is planning to say that America's democracy was nearly stolen from her on January 6th. To hear that, not from a Democrat, not from someone who's anti-Trump, but from a conservative judge, will give this entire uh, in enterprise, the January 6th committee, a conservative if imprimatur. Good point.
Scott, what else can we expect from Thursday's public hearing? This is, of course, uh, another one, and it's expected to be all eyes on it, right? I kind of assumed because he's such a good reporter, Bob did have a crystal ball, but we'll leave that aside for a few minutes. This will go about two hours. The first two hearings did as well. We expect the primary voices are going to be the committee members and the pre-taped depositions that they've queued up for this. So far, the witnesses have been a small fraction of the hearing themselves. They could confound expectations and make Judge Ludig make Mr. Jacob a bigger component tomorrow. But I think one name we're going to hear a lot, besides Mike Pence, is John Eastman, this California lawyer who once ran for Congress in California, obscure somewhat, but became an 11th hour legal advisor who got the ear of former President Trump and composed this memo that Bob had reported on about how to shift the electoral count, how to overturn the electoral count January 6th. It's interesting to note that the committee has shown a lot of its cards before these hearings in its legal challenges against John Eastman in California, trying to pry free emails and notes from John Eastman. That's where this committee once noted that they had a belief that John Eastman and Donald Trump likely committed conspiracy to obstruct the official proceeding here January 6th and to defraud the United States. And Robert, speaking of John Eastman, I mean, how much of a role did Eastman actually have in Trump's effort to push these fraud claims? John Eastman played a critical role in the weeks before January 6, 2021. As my uh, reporting colleague Bob Woodward and I worked on our book, Peril, it became clear that Eastman was this figure who, as Scott said, migrates into Trump's orbit during the final weeks of the presidency and starts to make a case to Trump that he can stay in power, that there's a plan he's outlined, that in some, some roundabout way, Trump could use Pence to delay the certification to allow states, red states, to nominate new so-called alternate electors to change the election, to overturn the election. Trump bought into this argument. He had Eastman in the Oval Office January 4th, 2021 confronted Pence, and they said to Pence, listen to John. That's what Trump said to Pence. Listen to Eastman. He has the plan. Pence says, I can't do it. I can't do it. Trump tried again on January 5th, the next day again on the morning of January 6th. But Eastman was always in Trump's ear saying this is possible constitutionally, even when so many others, including Greg Jacob and Michael Ludig, were saying the opposite. That tension in those scenes could come to the fore during Thursday's hearing. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And lastly, Scott, there was a big verdict in a high-profile January 6th criminal case. Can you tell us about that? A particularly high-profile defendant, Matt, his name is Kevin Seafried. He's from Laurel, Delaware. He's the man who was parading that Confederate flag here January 6th. He put his fate in the hands of a judge. It was a bench trial, so there was no jury. But this judge, a 27 appointee to the court, had partially or fully acquitted the other defendants who'd gone on trial before him in previous months. So we were watching for the verdict today for Kevin Seafried, convicted on all counts. Sentencing is September 16th, and I'll note I was in the courtroom 17 months after Mr. Seafried paraded that Confederate flag around the Capitol. He was in tears in the courtroom hugging his supporters. Wow. All right, Scott McFarlane and Robert Costa, two of the best on the Hill and in Washington, D.C. as a whole. Thank you to both of you.